Good morning and welcome. We're here today to worship the Lord our God, to hear of the good news of Jesus Christ and to, to meet in the presence of God and know the work of his spirit in our hearts and in our lives. Uh, big purposes, big things we, we've come together to do. So let's just pray now and uh, commit our time to the Lord. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to meet in your presence. We thank you for your wonderful grace in our lives that we can come to you today without fear, but with the comfort of the gospel of Jesus Christ, knowing that he has died for our sins, knowing that he has paid the price and opened the way to you. And if we trust in him, we have been forgiven, that we come as your children, your people. Lord, help us to, to know that, to be comforted by that, to be encouraged by that. And Lord, to spend this time together as those who have that privilege, praising you and rejoicing in you together. And Lord, for those who are here this morning who don't yet know Christ, I pray that you would open eyes, open hearts, bring faith that all of us may leave as those who know Jesus as our Saviour and Lord. Amen. Psalm 95 says, Come, let us shout joyfully to the Lord. Shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Let us enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout triumphantly to him in song. We're going to spend some time now in sung worship. Uh, we worship God together as we call one another to come and praise the Lord, to rejoice, to rejoice with one heart and one voice, and then to focus on God together, O God beyond all praising. So let's stand and sing, come people of the risen King, and O God beyond all praising.
Let's pray. For the Lord is a great God, a great King. The depths of the earth are in his hand. The mountain peaks are his. The sea is his. He made it. His hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God and we are his people. Father, help us to come and bow our hearts before you. We thank you that you are the great God, the maker of heaven and earth. We thank you that you are powerful, all-powerful. And Lord, it amazes us that you are also all-caring and compassionate and gracious. Lord, we want to worship you this morning. Amen. I'm going to hand over now to Ray for the children's talk. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Right, okay, question for you. Uh, who is this? Does anybody recognise who this is? Hmm. Might need a help from an adult, do you think? Think somebody? Okay, does anybody know? Yes, Catherine at the back. Well, what's her name there? Kate. Kate Middleton. Okay, Kate Middleton. And she was a very ordinary young girl, young lady, okay? And she went to St Andrews University in Scotland. Does anybody know who this fella is? Hands up if you think you know who this fella is. You might recognise it. He's got a lot less hair these days. A lot less hair. Who is he? It is. No, not Harry. Who's the other one? William, William, William. Prince William. It's Prince William. It's Prince William. It is the king's son. Okay? Now, what do you think happened when William met Kate? What happened? What do you think? What do you think they did? What do boys and girls do when they're sort of that age at university? Come on. Who's going to tell me? Yeah, you know, what did they do? What did they do? They fell in love. Yeah, they fell in love. So you had an ordinary young lady falling in love with the king's son. Okay. Now, when they'd fallen in love, and as a result, do you know what happened? As a result, Kate, who was very ordinary, she had to change her ways. They got married. But it was no ordinary wedding because it was a royal wedding. And Kate, because she was in love with the king's son, had to do things the right way, okay? Now, Kate is not the same today as she was back there at university, okay? She was an ordinary, normal young lady, but now she's a princess. Isn't that amazing? She's a princess, and she does things that a princess does, including wearing a tiara like a little crown there on her head isn't that amazing now we're looking at people in the bible but who met jesus but let's just remind ourselves who is jesus who is jesus can anybody tell me who jesus is who is he yeah the son of god and if god is king what does that make him well a prince yes makes him the, the son of the king it makes him the prince doesn't it Effectively, so we're going to look, we've been looking at people who have met Jesus. Okay, so effectively they're meeting the king's son. So let's see today, as we see the next person who met Jesus, we're going to see whether that person was changed like Kate was changed when she met the king's son. Okay, to see whether meeting the king's son changes somebody. So we're going to read the story, and the story is... About Zacchaeus. So I think I might be able to read it. No, I'm going to read it from here. It's okay. So he entered Jericho. That's Jesus, okay? Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. There was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector. What does a tax collector do? What does he do? What does a tax collector do? Yeah. He collects money. Yeah, he goes around and he collects money. That's his normal job to collect money and take money off the people. 
and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was not able because of the crowd, since he was a short man. I have a lot of sympathy for Zacchaeus. So running ahead, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus since he was about to pass that way. The king's son is coming. Zacchaeus wants to see him. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, because today it is necessary for me to stay at your house. Wow, that's quite amazing, isn't it? So Zacchaeus, he quickly came down and welcomed him joyfully, really happy. All who saw it began to complain. He's gone to stay with a sinful man. So Zacchaeus had been collecting all the taxes and he was rich. He'd been taken a bit too much. So he, people didn't like him. They thought he was a sinful man. But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor. Lord, and if I have exalted, that means if I've taken too much, anything from anyone, if I've taken too much from anyone, I'll pay them back four times as much. Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came, has come to seek and to save the lost. Wow! So who met Jesus? What was the name of the person that met Z Jesus? Thank you. Thank you, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus met Jesus, and Jesus is very special, isn't he? He is God's son. He's the son of the king. He's more special than Prince William. Did Zacchaeus fall in love with Jesus? Not in a romantic way, but did Zacchaeus fall in love with Jesus? He did, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Yeah? Notice how Zacchaeus welcomed him joyfully. Zacchaeus was really pleased to see Jesus, and he welcomed him joyfully. So Zacchaeus truly and deeply met Jesus, and Jesus had changed Zacchaeus, hasn't he? He had changed his heart. How do, how do we know that Zacchaeus' heart had changed? What did he do? Did he do something differently? What did he do? What did he do? He had lots of money. He was rich to start with. What happened? What did he do? He did, yes, well done, good boy. He gave away the money, didn't he? He gave half of his money to the poor and he said, if I've done anybody wrong, I'm going to give them four times. So Jesus had changed Zacchaeus' life. Zacchaeus truly believed in Jesus and he trusted in Jesus. And as a result, he started doing the things that would honour Jesus, the things that would please Jesus. He started to put right the wrong things he had done. So Zacchaeus met Jesus, and in meeting Jesus, Zacchaeus was changed, just like Kate was changed. Zacchaeus was changed. He'd met the king's son. And what we do, thinking about us, what we do on earth is important. What we do here is important. And if we've truly met Jesus, it will have changed our lives. And we'll want to do the right things. You know, we always sin and we can't do all the right things all the time, but we will want to do the right things if we've met Jesus. So the question really is, have you met Jesus? Have you met the King's Son? Have you put your trust in him? If not, you can do it right now if you wanted to. And if you have met Jesus, has he changed your life? Has he changed you from doing bad things to doing good things for him? Because we should be doing the right things, because Jesus changes people, and he makes us, we want to be more like Jesus, don't we? We want to be more like him. Okay, and we're going to sing that song now. We're going to sing, I want to be more like Jesus. Now, the challenge with this song is, it's got lots of actions, and I don't know all of them. So can you come and help me? Yeah? Come on, everybody come up and help me. You can know the actions. Come on. Come on. Anita, you can come as well. <laughs> come on, we know there's some good actions in this one. 
Love, joy, peace, and patience too. Grow in those who trust in you. Yes, come on. That's it. All right, we're going to give it a go. Yes, okay, let's sing this through. going to pray and then you can go back to your seats okay let's pray father we thank you for the story of Zacchaeus we thank you that it reminds us how having met Jesus we should be changed people father we should love you wholeheartedly and do the right things help us to know that, help us to love you firstly. We pray for the children that they would love you and know you as their Lord and Saviour. And Father, we pray that you would help each one of us to then do the right things, to honour you in our lives because we love the Saviour. So Father, we pray you'll continue to bless us now, bless the children as they go from us and continue with us in the service, we pray, and help each one of us to be more like Jesus, we ask in his name. Amen. I had intended to do the notices at the beginning of the service, but when I welcomed everybody and said, we're here to worship God, it didn't seem quite right to say, and now look at the notice sheet. Uh, if you have a paper copy from, from the door or you, you access it online, please just um, take a note of a couple of things. This Wednesday, we have our prayer groups. Um, so your prayer group leader should have been in contact or will be in contact to let you know where that is. If you're not part of a prayer group, a small group, and you want to be, please uh, come and speak to me or one of the other elders afterwards. And also, um, on the back of the sheet, or on the bottom if you're looking at it online, uh, there's a few notices uh, to do with Holiday Club. Please do make sure that you read them, and if you're able to help in any of the ways that are asked for there, please speak to Carrie or Judith, depending on which notice you're replying to. Today we want to pray again for um, the work of Open Doors and particularly for countries and Christians in those countries where they're persecuted for their faith. And we've been praying through the World Watch List and today we've come to number four on that list which is Eritrea, uh, which is known as the North Korea of Africa. So the hardest place in Africa to, to be a Christian. Um, it has an intense 
authoritarian government. And uh, there, there are some kind of recognized and very heavily monitored churches, but anyone who falls outside of those um, kind of government authenticated or, or um, registered churches, uh, such as evangelicals or Pentecostals, are at constant risk of persecution. Uh, there are raids that happen um, often to round up unsanctioned believers, and church leaders are particularly targeted. And what that often leads to is uh, Christians being put into Eritrea's notorious prison network, which seems to be kind of a place where you go, and it's very unlikely that you come out. There's no sort of accountability to it. There's no process to it. And um, at the moment, the estimates are at least a 1,000 Eritrean Christians are imprisoned. Many of them haven't been charged. Uh, many of them haven't even been in court. So it's a very hard, difficult situation for Christians. Um, open Doors tell us that the kind of a testimony of someone uh, they, they call Abdullah, it's, it's not his real name, who has given his life to Christ, he's become a Christian, and that cost him his job, his freedom, and then eventually his life. Uh, I'll, I'll just read what they put here. This persecution might have ended if he'd renounced Jesus, but that was something he refused to do. He knows Jesus is worth the cost. Like most Eritreans, Abdullah grew up in a Muslim home. When he decided to follow Jesus, he could have been a secret believer, but he was so passionate about his new faith that he couldn't keep it quiet. He told everyone at work about Jesus. He wanted them to know the good news. Lucas was angry as he shared Jesus and secretly recorded him while baiting him into making political comments. The next day, Abdullah was arrested, imprisoned, he fell sick, and eventually died. One of the things that strikes me as we, we read of people in countries like Eritrea it is the clarity that they have that they know Jesus is worth the cost. I think that's something that maybe we can, can... Do we know Jesus is worth the cost in our lives? Are we willing to give things up for Jesus? It's something we could easily say, but many of us have so much and we haven't had to give much up. But Jesus is worth the cost. And so as we pray now for Christians in Eritrea, let's, let's pray that, that they would know Jesus is worth the cost. And that they would have that faith that is willing to lose everything for him. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Eritrea. We recognize as we come to you that we, we live lives that are so comfortable, lives where we are not having to make these sacrifices. And there's a sense in which as we come, words are easy Lord, we pray that we would feel more of what our brothers and sisters are going through. Lord, that we would recognize that the difficulties we face. But Lord, we thank you that as we come to you, we know that you understand completely the situation they're in. You know what they're going through, both in the sense of the facts of it, but also the experience of it. Because in Christ, you experience persecution and harassment and torture and pain and mistreatment. You experience people seeking to trap you in your words. And Lord Jesus as you look on your church in Eritrea, you can say those two precious words, I know what you are going through. Lord, may that be a comfort to your people today. And, and may they know that in you, Lord Jesus, they have a treasure that is worth more than anything this world can give. 
a, a treasure that if we were to discover it in a field, uh, uh, buried in a, a tre- chest, we would sell everything we had in order to have it. When we think of that parable that you told. Father, we pray that the preciousness of knowing Christ might be something very, very real to our brothers and sisters as they are called to pay this cost for following you. Father, we pray that you would change the heart of government. We pray that you would turn around uh, this strict authoritarianism uh, that has such a hatred of you and your people. And there might be a recognition of the good that Christians do in society, of the good that can come from a church that is vibrant and growing. Father, we pray that if there is this myth that Christians make bad citizens, that that would be removed and recognize that actually Christians make the best citizens as they walk in the the ways of Jesus, loving you and loving others. Father, we pray for those who have opportunity to share the message of Christ with those in power that, Lord, your Holy Spirit would be in those encounters and in those moments and that you would bring faith, bring faith to the the leaders that they too may repent of sin and come to trust in Jesus. We pray for this on a local level too. Lord, we think of this person that Abdullah was able to share his testimony with, share the message of Christ with. We pray that you would prick his conscience in in what he has done and that you would use that to be merciful and bring him to faith. And and others too in the same situation. Lord, we lift up our brothers and sisters. We pray for them. We pray for their witness. We pray for their faith. We pray as they face this threat of persecution that you would uphold them and strengthen them. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, let's pick up in our next two songs, that worth of Jesus, the preciousness of knowing him. Jesus, Jesus, all sufficient beyond telling is your worth. And then we'll stay standing and sing all my days.
to be. Bible, would you like to turn with me to Revelation chapter 2? We're going to read from verse 18. It will also be on the screen behind me, but if you do have a Bible, it's worth having it open as well. Just before we uh, read that together, let me just remind you uh, where we're at in the book of Revelation. Uh, In this book, which was written for Christians to encourage us to stand firm as we wait for Jesus to return. Uh, to give us understanding of what's going on in our day, uh, and particularly to encourage us to keep hold of Christ uh, and to trust in him even when the circumstances around us look uh, kind of very rocky and very shaky. And the point that we're at in the book at the moment is the first vision. It's uh, John identifies himself as a fellow struggler uh, waiting for Jesus to return and being persecuted while he does so. We have a vision of Jesus, which we looked at a number of weeks ago. And then these seven letters to the churches. There are real churches um, in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, uh, that this is written to. And each of these churches we discover as we read the letters was facing a particular threat to their faith and their witness. So for Ephesus, the first one, the threat was their own um, kind of unbalanced Christianity, that they were focusing on faithfulness and works and not on love for Jesus. When we get to Smyrna, the second letter, the threat was the threat of persecution. They were the persecuted church. Uh, The third letter to Pergamon, the threat was compromise. They were compromising, uh, diluting Jesus. We talked about it with that metaphor. They they were following Jesus, but also trying to follow the idols and the ways of the world around them. And today, as we come to Thyatira, we're going to see that the threat that faced this church was the threat of false teaching. And as we look at the letters that way, we discover that they aren't only relevant for the churches they were originally written to, they're relevant for us as well, because these seven threats that we're going to see in these seven letters are very much threats to our faith and our witness today. So we have a lot to learn from these letters. So let's start reading from chapter 2, verse 18, and we'll read through to the end of the chapter. Write to the angel of the church in Thyatira, thus says the Son of God, 
the one whose eyes are like a fiery flame and whose feet are like fine bronze. I know your works, your love, faithfulness, service, and endurance. I know that your last works are greater than your first. But I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and teaches and deceives my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat meat sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to repent of her sexual immorality. Look, I will throw her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great affliction unless they repent of her works. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who examines minds and hearts, and I will give to each of you according to your works. I say to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who haven't known the so-called secrets of Satan, as they say, I am not putting any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works to the end I will give him authority over the nations, and he will rule them with an iron scepter. He will shatter them like pottery. Just as I have received this from my father, I will also give him the morning star. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray for God's help as we look at his word. Father, guide us. By your spirit, as we look into your word now, show us more of Christ and the importance of trusting in him and only trusting in him. Amen. I don't know if you um, look at the sports pages in the, the newspapers or whether you go on to sports pages on the internet, but if you have done over the last couple of months, you probably wouldn't have failed to notice comments about two particular England teams. On the one hand, you've got the England rugby team. Nearly won last night. Not quite. So are you a happy flow? At the beginning of the Six Nations tournament, lots was made of the defence of the England rugby team. How they'd improved this blitz defence that they were implementing. But there was all kinds of questions about their attack. Could they string the passes together? Could they open up the other team and actually score the points? So we had a team that seemed to be impressive in defence, but questionable in attack. Then you had the England cricket team. With so-called basball, as it is known, a team that likes to play on the offensive. And if they get it right, well, they can score any amount of runs that they want. But there's all kinds of questions about their defence. If it's not going right in attack, they don't seem to be able to do very good. You see, what do we learn from those stories? What do we learn from those comments? In sport, no matter what sport you're playing, if you're that sort of team game against someone else, you need to be good in attack and good in defense. You need both. If you look at the Premier League title at the moment, Arsenal are top of the league, just to point that out to anyone who supports other teams. They have scored the most goals and they've let in the least. Kind of bears that point out. You have to be best in attack and best in defense. Can I tell you that's true in the church as well? If you want to be an effective church for Jesus Christ, if we want to be an effective church for Jesus Christ, we need to be good going forward and we need to be good in defense. 
We come to the, the church of Thyatira in this letter. We see here's a, good, a church that has no problems in attack, no problems going forward. Look at verse 19. What does Jesus say? I know your works, your love, faithfulness, service, and endurance. And then this is the key thing. I know that your last works are greater than your first. So your love today is greater than it used to be. Your faithfulness is greater than it used to be. Your service is more than it used to be. Your endurance is better than it used to be. They're going forwards. But they've left themselves open to the enemy's counterattack. Verse 20. But I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and teaches and deceives my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Here's the attack. It's the attack of false teaching. And although they're good going forwards, their defense is failing against Satan's attack. What I want us this morning to, is to ask this question, what can we learn from this letter that will help us defend against false teaching in the church today? I think it's important to recognize there is false teaching in the church today, there's false teaching in the world today, and it is something that gets in uh, to us um, and far more easily than it used to because we have social media, we have YouTube, we have the internet. Uh, it's not just books and it's not just people that come up to the front of church buildings that teach us anymore. It, it's, it's far more than that. So how can we make sure we are defending against false teaching that we don't get knocked sideways by the devil's counterattack in our lives. There are four things from this letter I want to, to point out that we can kind of piece together as it's teaching on how can we deal with false teaching. First thing is this. We need to know that Jesus has all we need. We need to know that Jesus has all we need. Not just in the sense that Jesus is all we need, uh, we'll come to that later, that he is the only hope that we need. He has all the joy that we need for life and happiness, but that he also has all we need as we seek to defend against false teaching. Verse 18, write to the angel of the church in Thyatira, thus says the Son of God, the one whose eyes are like a fiery flame and whose feet are like fine bronze. Beginning of each of these letters, Jesus introduces himself and he says certain things about himself that then uh, are connected to what he's going to say in the letter. That help us to understand or help us to stand if we know these things about Jesus. And that's true here. And as Jesus introduces his, himself, he is introducing himself as the person we need in order to fight false teaching. Let me just show you that in the three things he says. First of all, we see that Jesus has all authority. Thus says the Son of God. What does it mean when we read the words, the Son of God? It's kind of a phrase that's already come out this morning, but what does it mean? It means two very important things. First of all, it is a statement of Jesus' nature. The Bible tells us there is one God who exists as three persons and each of those persons are equally God and they are distinct from each other. One God, three persons, it gets confusing as we think about it, but this is what the Bible teaches. And those persons are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when we read that Jesus is the Son of God, one of the things that we're being told is that he is that second person of the triune God. He is the Son of God, who is fully God. So that's the first thing we're told. But it's not the only thing we're told by that statement. You see, the word or the term Son of God in the Bible also applies to identify and distinguish God's human king. In the Old Testament, 
the king of Israel, was referred to as the son of God. We have it in Psalm 2, verse 7. Psalm 2 is actually quoted here later in this letter. At this kingly psalm, I will declare the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I become your father. You're the king. You are my son. Today I become your father. And all of this points towards the ultimate messianic king, who is Jesus, the son of God, who came in the flesh and took on the role of the messianic king and became the son of God. So the son of God refers to his nature as God and his role as God's king. Now what do both of those things have in common? Both of those are positions of authority. And that's really important when it comes to battling false teaching. You see, who am I to say to someone, you're wrong? Who am I to say to someone, you're really wrong? In fact, you're so wrong that you have to be put outside the church. And we have to question whether you're really a Christian. Who am I to say that? I don't know if you've ever had that experience as a church member at a church members meeting where you've had to vote to put someone outside the fellowship, to remove their membership. It's a really difficult thing, isn't it? And one of the difficulties, who am I to make this decision? Here we're reminded if we walk in Jesus' ways, we do not do these things on our own authority. We do them in his. He is the one who can say these things. And so as we lean on him and follow him, we have all the authority we need to make those decisions. He has authority. Secondly, he sees things as they are. He introduces himself as the one with eyes like a fiery flame, these eyes that penetrate in vision into people's hearts and into people's lives to see things as they really are. And again, this is really important as we battle false teaching. Paul says to the elders in Ephesus, the last time he met with them, he said, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Now, savage wolves here, he's talking about false teachers. And he identifies them as wolves coming to destroy the flock of sheep. Now, if you were to look on a field and, and there's the sheep and there's a wolf, it's fairly obvious who's who. If you look on, on that field, there's the sheep, they're fluffy and they're white. And there's the wolf, that, that's the one with the big teeth and the growl. And, the, and it's quite obvious, isn't it? But the problem is in reality... It isn't that obvious. Those of you who are at primary school, a few of you lift up your head from your books at this point, uh, tomorrow morning, imagine, okay, it doesn't matter which primary school you go to, whether it's Park Lane, New Road, or AJS, somebody from Ramsey Junior School decides they want to come to your primary school tomorrow morning. Okay, somebody. Didn't. So they turn up, in their Ramsey Junior School uniform. Now, if you're at Park Lane, where you wear blue, or you're at New Road, where you wear purple, it's fairly obvious when someone comes with a red jumper, because that's what Ramsey Junior School wear, it's fairly obvious that they don't belong. If you go to AJS and you wear a red jumper, it's not quite so obvious, but look at the symbol. Ramsey Junior School has a spinning wheel, not the same as AJS. So again, it's fairly obvious they don't belong. But imagine they went out over the weekend to Chroma Sports and brought the uniform of your school. And they turn up. Can you tell they don't belong? Can you really tell? Are you sure? Absolutely sure? We have a phrase, a wolf in sheep's clothing. And it comes from this idea of the, the wolves among the sheep. But the wolves come dressed as sheep. So how do we know who the false teachers are? Oh, thank goodness Jesus sees people's hearts. And nothing deceives him. 
He has everything we need. And then the third thing he tells us, he can't be toppled. we got these bronze feet, this solidity about Jesus. The attacks come, but he will still stand. Those of you who are older, that was an illustration for the younger ones. Those of you who are older, my age and older, you will remember Dad's Army. No, not the original Dad's Army, the, the comedy show. You'll remember Dad's Army. And you'll know that what happens when, when, when there's any slight sign of a threat of a German soldier or something coming in, in against the, the platoon of Dad's Army. Corporal Jones will whip out his um, bayonet, and what would he say? I knew you'd watched it. <laughs> Don't panic, Captain Mannering. And, and this is the comedy of it. Here's this 80-year-old man wielding his bayonet against no matter how many German troops. That really does not instill confidence. But Jesus does. False teaching comes. It ravages the church. A wolf among the sheep. It destroys, it harms. But here's the confidence. It will never overcome Christ. It will never defeat the purposes of Jesus. Jesus has all we need. First thing we need to remember. We take on false teaching or we think about defending ourselves against false teaching. We are not alone. In Matthew 18, Jesus talks about church discipline, how to deal with church discipline, and, and that process that ends up with putting someone out of the church, that, that very painful process. And I refer to that not because he's exactly talking about false teaching, but, but it is a process that should be taken when there's false teaching in the church. The painfulness of it, the difficulty of it, or the questions that come from it. But at the end of that passage... Jesus brings this encouragement. Where two or three are gathered together in my name. So there you are. You you might just be a small group of faithful people seeking to do my will, Jesus says. But where you're gathered in my name, I am there among you. I'm with you. And that's something we need to remember. What's the concern? Maybe it's a concern. Is this false teaching? I don't know. Is it something that passes that boundary and becomes something that's dangerous and we need to deal with? I don't know. What should I do about it? What should we do about it? This seems hard. This seems risky. Whatever the concern we can turn to Jesus with it. Not just we can, we should bring it to Jesus. Because he's the one who's equipped with all the tools that we need to deal with false teaching in the church. So That's the first thing that we see here. Jesus has everything we need. The second thing we see in this letter, false teaching is dangerous. False teaching is dangerous. Look at verse 20. But I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and teaches and deceives my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat feet, eat feet, eat meat sacrificed to idols. Here is the danger of false teaching. There's two parts of the danger or two reasons why false teaching is dangerous. The first is this. It's dangerous because it points to a different saviour. Dangerous because it points to a different saviour. The the lady in question, it doesn't have to be a lady to be a false teacher, it can be a lady or a man, we see both in the Bible, but in this instance it's a lady. The lady in question is called Jezebel, probably not her literal name. It's probably not the name on her birth certificate. It is a descriptive name from the Old Testament. Jezebel in the Old Testament is a wicked queen. She was the wife of King Ahab. If you want to to read about it, I think it's about 1 Kings 16, um, or is it 2 Kings? Yeah, 1 Kings 16 to, to 19. That sort of area you'll find out about Jezebel. She single handedly sponsored Baal and Asherah worship in Israel. 
So there were 450 priests of Baal, one idol, and 400 priests of Asherah, another idol. And all of these priests, 850 of them, ate at Jezebel's table. She single-handedly sponsored that religion. Not only did she do that, she promoted and put pressure through Ahab on the country to follow Baal and Asherah. And even when Elijah, um, the God's leading, had the competition on the top of Mount Carmel to see who was really God, Baal or God, even after God clearly won that competition, Jezebel was having none of it and she wanted to be promoting Baal worship. In effect, she was a prophetess teaching a different message to the message of God. What's the message of God? Lean on me, God says, and I will give you, keep you safe. And Jezebel was saying, lean on Baal and Asherah, and they will keep you safe. That, that's the heart of the message that was being taught by Elijah. Lean on God, and he will keep you safe. And Jezebel, lean on Baal and Asherah, and they will keep you safe. When we come to Thyatira, Jezebel we find the same difference, the same message. She was teaching a message that encouraged people to get involved in idol worship rather than trusting Jesus. Rather than saying your hope is found in Christ, she was saying your hope is found in idol worship. Rather than saying your hope is found in Jesus and following him, your hope is found in going to the temples and taking part in the ceremonies there. At the heart of her message was this. She was pointing to a different saviour. Let me just take a, a slide aside here. What is false teaching? I think this is really important. False teaching is more than someone asking questions or expressing doubts on what we see as orthodox theology. If someone is asking questions, there might be an importance in, in helping them to answer those. If someone is expressing doubts, there might be an important thing coming alongside them. And if they keep on expressing that doubts, maybe saying, okay, maybe don't teach for a while until you work this out. You know, things like if somebody's saying, I'm not sure Jesus is the Son of God, well, that, that is serious and you need to work with them. But it doesn't necessarily mean yet they're a false teacher if it's just expressing some doubts that they have. But false teaching isn't defined by a difference of opinion on certain things. Romans 14 talks about difference of opinions on practice. Do you eat meat? Do you not eat meat? Do you, uh, different things that you do. How do you de deal with Sunday? Or, or are you allowed to do things on Sunday or not allowed to do things on Sunday? Romans 14 deals with those differences. But at no point do we have the term false teacher brought in on that. Or we might class secondary doctrines here, a view on baptism, a view on spiritual gifts. If, if it differs from us, are they a false teacher? I'd say no, not on that basis alone. And false teaching is more than a clumsy explanation. You know, don't you, as we try and describe things, sometimes we struggle for words and we might put it in a clumsy way that actually when you reflect on it, it is saying something completely different to what you intended. I've, put my, I've done that so many times up front here. That doesn't make someone a false teacher because they put in a clumsy explanation. What is false teaching? Here's the definition I came up with. A message that diverts away from the biblical Jesus to someone or something else. False teaching is a message that diverts away from the biblical Jesus to someone or something else. Presents a different saviour. Let me give you an example of this. I don't know if you've heard of um, an American preacher called Joel Osteen. A number of years ago, Joel Osteen preached a uh, sermon and he released a book called The Power of I Am. It had such an impact that he ended up on Oprah Winfrey. And when I heard about that, and I knew a few people in the congregation where I was at the time, 
uh, listened to Joel Osteen, I thought, okay, I, I probably need to watch this sermon and, and find out a little bit about what he's saying. The point of the sermon was this. The way to make things better in your life is to speak positive words to yourself. So you're feeling weak. Tell yourself you're strong and you'll feel better. You feel you can't do it. Tell yourself you can. And and throughout the sermon, about 30 minutes, this is what he was saying. Speak positive words to yourself. At the end of the sermon, he then said, and if you want to give your life to Jesus, here's a prayer that you can pray. And I was like, what? I went back to check. He had not mentioned Jesus all the way through the sermon. And then we're saying, now if you want to give your life to Jesus. Now, I have not listened or read enough of Joel Osteen to stand up here and categorically say he is a false teacher, but that sermon was false teaching, if that makes sense. Because it is directing hope onto something you do rather than something Jesus has done. That the hope of joy and, and, and a better life is in your positive words, not in Jesus and his death for you on the cross and his resurrection. It is diverting people away from Jesus. False teaching is dangerous because it points to a different saviour. And Jesus alone is the one who gives hope. And so pointing anyone to anything else is pointing them to despair. So it's dangerous because it points to a different saviour. Secondly, it's dangerous because it takes people away from Christ. That's the result of pointing to a different saviour. As that begins to influence people in their hearts and in their minds, people turn away from Jesus. And that's what we see here in Revelation 2.20. Some people have been deceived or seduced, the ESV says, away from Jesus into something else. Paul, in the book of Galatians, he he begins, near the beginning he says, I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, a different message. Not that there is another gospel, That's the point, that there is no other good news. So if it's not Jesus, it's bad news. But there are some who are troubling you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, a curse be on him. That's a strong word, isn't it? A curse be on him. Could, Could you imagine if... I stood up the front on a Sunday and I brought with me a list of things I'd heard that had been said wrong over the week. Maybe on the news, maybe on the television, maybe yeah, in all kinds of places. And I brought every statement that was wrong and unbiblical and said, right, what are we going to do? We're going to do it collectively because it takes too long out of our service otherwise. And we're going to, uh, all these people, I'm going to name them and then all together now, a curse be on them. Would we do that? That's strong. God, judge them. But Paul is doing that here. Why? Because the wrong gospel that is being taught, and in this case in Galatians, it wasn't a gospel absence of Jesus, but it was a gospel absent of the biblical Jesus. They modified him. The wrong gospel that is being taught was taking people away from hope away from joy, away from salvation, and pointing them in a different direction. And Paul says there is nothing as bad as that. So a curse be on them. When it comes to false teaching, it's important we recognize it's dangerous. It's not just semantics and words It's lives and eternity that are at stake. And so when we hear things 
It's really important that we are careful about what we hear before we affirm what we hear. It's important that we test the things we hear. At the end of 1 Thessalonians, we're told, don't despise prophecies. Now, okay, there's a whole big topic we could talk about here, but, but let's just understand prophecies generally, messages from God. When you hear things, are they from God? Are they not from God? Don't despise them. Don't be cynical about the things you're hearing. Don't almost don't expect it to be wrong and need to be proved it's right. But test all things. How do you know it's from God or not? Test it against the measure of what we do know is from God, the Bible. So as I'm teaching on a Sunday, as I'm preaching to you on a Sunday, it's really important that you either have the Bible open or it's up there on the screen. And you're, is that really what it says? One of the, the things that happened recently in, in our house on the, the table, we, we go around, you know, what did you learn today from the, the sermon? What stood out to you from the sermon? We had a conversation about, about the sermon. And uh, at one point, someone in my family said, I don't think what you said was what that meant. They were saying, I think what you said was right, but probably from a different passage to this one. And as hard as that was to hear, because we're all proud, I was thrilled. Not just accepting it because I said it, but asking the question, are we testing what we hear from the Bible? When you listen to Christian radio, don't assume because it says Christian radio, it's Christian radio. When you listen to something that you discover, a piece of music, a song that is is in the Christian section of Apple Music or Spotify, don't assume it's right. Test it. Does it fit with the Bible? When you read a book, just because you got it from a Christian bookstore doesn't mean it's biblical. Or the most dangerous place, YouTube. Because anyone can put stuff on YouTube. Anyone can place up this fantastically made video that can get hundreds of thousands of views. Anyone can call themselves a preacher and a teacher on YouTube. There's no testing, there's no filtering, there's no accountability. And so we must test what we hear against the Bible. False teaching is dangerous. That's the second thing we see. So Jesus has all we need. False teaching is dangerous. Thirdly, false teaching needs to be dealt with. False teaching needs to be dealt with. This doesn't take long to see it in this chapter. We see it in the rebuke of Jesus. What's the problem with the church in Thyatira? The problem is that they tolerate the woman Jezebel. They let her go on with what she's doing. It seems, as you read it through, that they probably identify that she's doing something wrong, that this is not good in the church, but they're not doing anything about it. I want you to imagine the scene. You're staying in a hotel, um, and you're about to go to bed, so you turn the light off. But in that instance where your finger is pushing the light switch, so just at that point between the rocker of off and on, out of the corner of your eye, you see a dark shape in the top corner of the room. And you think you saw eight legs. And then it goes dark. What do you do? Do you let it lie? You know, if you do it, if you sleep with your mouth open, it might end up in there. That, that's what some people say, isn't it? Do you let it lie? Or do you turn the light back on and deal with it? Either find out it wasn't a spider or, or, or put it outside somehow. Do you let it lie or do you deal with it? Thyatira had taken the option of letting Jezebel lie and continue. Taken the option of doing nothing. And that's Jesus' rebuke here. You tolerate her. 
rather than deal with her. False teaching needs to be dealt with. We see it in the example of Jesus. Look at verse 21 to 22. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to repent of her sexual immorality. Notice, first of all, before we see what he says clearly about judgment, he speaks about mercy. These are phrases dripping with mercy. Jesus has given her time to say, I'm sorry, and turn away. Maybe it's the warning of the church. Maybe the church have said, look, this is wrong. And Jesus is waiting to see, will she respond? But she does not want to. Jesus is not there ready to jump on every mistake we make and come with a hammer and bash us because we got something wrong. But Jesus does want us to repent. He does want us to be soft in our hearts. So as we receive his rebuke, we come back to him, repenting of our sin, receiving forgiveness, and knowing him. It's dripping with mercy, but it's clear on action. Look, I will throw her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great affliction, unless they repent of her works. Is Jesus going to make your life hard if you continue in your sin? Yes, that's a distinct possibility. When we look at suffering in our lives, it is wrong to see every suffering in our lives as punishment from God for something we've done. The Bible teaches us that. There's lots of reasons for suffering. But one of the reasons is that we are unrepentant and Jesus is dealing with us. That's what was going to happen here. It's what's happening in 1 Corinthians 11 over the communion table where you've got the rich people feasting it up and enjoying their riches and, and keeping the poor at the poor table and then saying, oh, we're one in Christ. Paul says that this is the reason why some of you are dying. What do you think of electric scooters? We're told, aren't we, that they're illegal to have on the road, illegal to have on the path. They must only be used on private property. Yet, as you walk around Whittlesea, there are lots of people riding around on electric scooters. Why? Is it because they don't think anyone's going to do anything about it? I don't think it's because they don't know the law, because we've been told that. But they don't... If you look around, there, there aren't many police that come through with to see, and they may be saying, look, there's no police, there's no, no one who can authorise to do anything, so why not just ride it? Do we think that Jesus won't deal with us if we're unrepentant in our sin? Jesus is clear. If there's a false teacher in the church, the church doesn't deal with it, the false teacher is unrepentant, Jesus will come. And sort this out. And then we see that the false teaching needs to be dealt with when we look at the priority of Jesus. Look at verse 23. I will strike her children dead. Then all of the churches will know that I am the one who examines the minds and hearts. And I will give to each of you according to your works. What's Jesus' priority? It's the honor of his name. He loves his people, and he's merciful to his people. But in this instance, the, the, the kind of what takes priority and brings about the decision is that Christ's name is being pulled through the dirt by the lack of action of his church. Jesus' priority is not the ease of his people. Not everyone getting on but the honour of his name. I remember a situation where a, a pastor was in a church and, and felt he had to challenge a controlling leader. There was another leader in the church who was uh, controlling everything, blocking anything that, for change and um, you know, overruling all the other leaders in the church. And that pastor, I remember, had two questions that he had to ask. One was, was he right? If you're ever going to challenge anyone, if you're ever going to take serious measures, you need to know you're right. 
And our hearts are deceitful, and we need to be able to examine our hearts with the help of the Spirit to know whether we're right or wrong. Is this me, or is this them? But the second question was, was he willing to take the risk? Because challenging this leader, it seemed that that would bring a split in the church. And that's a pretty major thing. In the end, that pastor went forward. But only because it seemed the right decision for the honour of Christ. Taking hard choices, if we, if, if, we, if we have as our chief value the ease of the church or, or the, the harmony of relationships, we won't do it. It's only if we have our chief value, the honour of Christ, that we're willing to take that stand. So again, when we come to false teaching, it's important that we are not passive. It's important that false teaching is exposed. I think there's, a, a, there's an element of responsibility on elders here, on, on me and the other elders, to do that. Not that we go out searching every corner of, of teaching, trying to expose every obscure wrong teaching. But where there is wrong teaching that is influencing people that we have care for, or might influence people we have care for, we should expose it and explain why and teach what is true. One example of that, um, a number of years ago, uh, there was this movement coming out of the States called the Emerging Church, sort of this fresh, fresh way of doing church. And one of the leaders in the Emerging Church was a guy called Rob Bell. I don't know if you've heard of him. Um, he might not. He produced several books. And uh, this movement was having an influence in the church, and Rob Bell seemed to be very influential, and people were starting to talk about him in the church where I was at. So I got his books, and I read them through. And they had lots of words that we use. But as you read through, you recognize that they're not using, he's not using them in the way that we use them. And so as you dig in, I discovered that the gospel he was preaching was not the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I produced a leaflet that explained that, that said why that was the case, and encouraging people to be extremely careful of his teaching. Because we mustn't be passive about false teaching. And then as a church, there's a collective uh, um, lack of, a collective need to not be passive, that we challenge false teaching, that we're willing to say, no, it's wrong, that is not what the Bible says, and that we're willing to stand on that even if it's painful. If there's no repentance, Jesus is indicating here that person should be put out of the church and not tolerated. We don't get to ignore false teaching and we don't get to bury our heads in the sand. Very quickly, fourth thing that we see. Two keys to a good defense. Two things to hold on to if we want to avoid false teaching. One, hold on to the Bible. Revelation 2, 24 to 25. I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who haven't known the so-called secrets of Satan, I am not putting any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. Simple. Hold on to the message of Jesus you've learned. Don't go after anything else. Where's the message of Jesus we've learned? It's the message we find in the Bible. False teaching looks good. Might look good because it's easier. One suggestion of the false teaching in Thyatira was a, a Gnostic teaching that went like this. If you want to know the fullness of the grace of Jesus, you need to experience the total depravity of sin. So the way to know more of Jesus is to throw yourself into sin more. You get the logic of, you, you know it's wrong, hopefully, but you get the logic of where that's come from. It, that might have been the lesson here. That's easier than the message we teach. Oh, I get to do sin and I get to do Jesus. Oh, that's so much easier. You can see why it's appealing. Or, or it might be appealing because it seems fresh. That was the issue with Rob Bell. It seems fresh, a fresh expression. It's trendy. And that can draw people along. Or it might look good because it's cloaked in tradition. Don't think because... It's been taught for generations that it's any less likely to be false teaching. 
Or don't think because it's clothed in religiosity that it's any less likely to be false teaching. The lesson of the Reformation in the 1500s, they challenged the teaching of centuries of the Roman Catholic Church by going earlier, because they discovered Augustine didn't believe any of the things that the Roman Catholic Church was teaching. And they discovered the traditions that had been passed on to them, even though they'd been there for centuries, were wrong. And they had to go back to the Bible. So hold on to the Bible. Don't be led astray by other things. And then secondly, hold on to the promises of Jesus. Verse 26 to 28. The one who conquers and who keeps my works to the end, I will give him authority over the nations. And he will rule with them. This this is um, Psalm 2. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will shatter them like pottery. Here is... God's king, his messianic king, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus is saying, if you stick with me, you will reign with me in eternity. And then he says, I will also give him the morning star. What's the morning star? Is it Venus? That's the suggestion. Is it the sun coming up? Seems to be a symbol of the dawn of light, of hope, of joy, joy after the darkness of night. It's something that, that we can long for after, after the, the darkness and of, of night, the light comes. It's something that just makes such a difference. Here, though, it's more than that. I don't know if you noticed it in our songs that we sang. Here it's Jesus himself. Revelation ends, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to attest these things to you for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. Jesus says, if you keep your faith in me, I will give you myself. Why would we believe a false gospel? We would only believe it if we think it's more likely to make us happy than Jesus. But if we hold on to the promises of Jesus, if we rehearse the promises of Jesus, if we remember the promises of Jesus, we will know that only he can make us truly happy. Two keys to a good defense. Hold on to the Bible. Hold on to the promise of Jesus. How's your defense? Do you recognize the danger of false teaching? Are you being careful with what you listen to? Are you prepared to deal with it, to stand up, to call it out, to make hard decisions? Are you asking Jesus to help you in those things? And are you holding on to the right things? Or are you easily turned away? Let's pray. Father, help us. As we take on board the teaching of this letter, we see the problem, the threat of false teaching to our faith and our witness as individuals and as a church. And we want to stand with good defense. Help us to know that Christ has everything we need to lean on him and help us to be willing to take those stands that we must take. And Lord, to focus on Jesus and the hope that he brings. Amen. Stand to sing together, O church, arise.
path to eternity with Christ will not be an easy one. It'll be one where we face hardship and threats to faith and witness. But Lord, help us to know that the end is a great one. When we stand with Christ in glory, may our eyes be fixed on him. Amen. Thank you.